This is Bible Q&A with John MacArthur, Bible teacher and author of the best-selling MacArthur New Testament Commentary Series. This is Denny Nugent. Today's question takes us to Colossians. Have you ever encountered some well-dressed folks knocking on your door wanting to argue with you that Jesus is not God? They love to quote a verse from Colossians to make their case. In chapter 1, Paul says that Jesus is, quote, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, John, why did he word his statement like that? That could sound like Jesus is a creature, not the creator. Well, the cults love to find their isolated and misinterpreted verses, don't they? And they, they certainly are, are good at finding those and confusing people who don't really know what Scripture is saying. In this case, however, if you look at the full text that you just quoted, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the direct copy. That's what that word means. He is the carbon copy, the exact reproduction, the duplication of the invisible God. Now, that's a title that can only be deemed to refer to deity, and God is uncreated. However, at the same time, Jesus is the prototokos. That's the Greek word translated firstborn, and it doesn't mean firstborn in chronology. It doesn't even have the word born in it. It means the premier one. The prototokos is the premier one. Of all who have ever been a part of the creation, he's the premier one. And of course he was part of the creation because he was born in a human form. So he is both the exact representation of God and a part of the creation. All right, thanks, John, and thank you for listening to Bible Q&A with John MacArthur. For more in-depth teaching from the Gospel of John, free of charge, visit MacArthurCommentaries.com. Oh, hey. How you doing? This is Bill, the snarky apologist. You know, I thought... I thought what I would do is I want to dig into Colossians 1.15 where the Bible says Jesus is the image of the, of the invisible God and you know all cult groups will go to this verse and say well look Jesus isn't uh, the almighty God he's not you know eternal he's created because it says here that you know he's uh, uh, the firstborn of all creation and you know what there's a concept in the Old Testament of firstbornness and that needs to be explored. You see, the problem that cults run into is that either they don't know how to do research, I think more than likely they don't want to do it, because if they do, they find out that their, their theology is, falls, it just dissolves, it falls apart. And there's good, good reason to believe that Jesus is not created, obviously, and we're going to look into those passages. See, like I always say, if you want to understand and, and learn something, you got to dig you got to get the resources and you got to dig. And you got to be honest with yourself. More importantly, you got to be honest with others. And there's a part in one of these books, I think it's in this one I want to show you. Well, I'll, not, not now. Okay, anyway, let's get into Colossians 1.15, the firstborn. And, uh, and i got to put these down. I roll it. Jeez oh, Louise, I think I broke a bone. Ugh. Let's begin our study looking at Colossians 1.15 in the New World Translation. It states, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. This is the starting point. From this point forward, they are conditioning their followers to a knee-jerk reflex. That being that whenever they see the word firstborn, they are to instantly and automatically think of it in terms of a creature. In other words, what else can it mean? It's the firstborn of a specific group. Hence, they use the term firstborn of Pharaoh, is because Pharaoh is the father. His child would be the son. His firstborn child would be the firstborn of Pharaoh. The firstborn is always of that group. The same holds true for animals. Uh, the firstborn animal is a firstborn animal simply because it had a father. This is the line of reasoning and logic that they disseminate to their followers. But is this logical? I think it's 
a logical fallacy for this reason. Let's take their concept and apply it to the scripture. If the firstborn son of Pharaoh is Pharaoh's son, because Pharaoh is the father, and Colossians says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, is Jesus a creature because his father was creation? Was it creation that parented Jesus, the creature? Well, certainly not. That would be ludicrous. Any thinking person would see the fallacy in that line of reasoning. So what can this firstborn title mean, if not first created? Well, we're going to take a look at a, a concept in the Old Testament, the history of Israel, known as the rights of firstbornness. When you understand the background, you can then apply it to the New Testament, and the light just, you want to talk about your light getting brighter, this is the way you do it, not listening to men. Your light will become brighter in the New Testament as you understand the Old Testament. Now when we look at the word firstborn, it has basically two meanings, birth order or birth right. When it speaks of birth order, we're saying that this is the oldest child in the family, be it male or female. It also relates to the first fruits, um, the harvest, the first created, first produced harvest. So it's an order of birth that it's relating to. When the word firstborn is used of birthright, it's referring to the child to whom is going to inherit the estate. The, and it does not always apply to the first child born. If it's a girl in the Old Testament, if the, if the girl, the female, is the first child born, the first created child is a female, well, the right of firstborn does not go to the oldest child in this case, but rather goes to the male even though the male may be the second person created, the second child created, he is now known as the firstborn, even though he's younger than the older sibling. The reasoning behind this is that the firstborn son would be most likely to have most of the father's um, virility and uh, stamina, endurance, intelligence, basic wherewithal, over all the subsequent children. So in the passing of the father, or if the father was incapable of taking care of the family, the firstborn would be in a better situation to care, nurture, and comfort, and take care of the family. Furthermore, the father, if he chose to, can transfer the birth rights from the oldest male to a younger male, if he so desired. Now, if you're a Jehovah's Witness looking in, Let's, let's find common ground. Let's find agreement in the history, the rich history of ancient Israel. Now, we know for a fact that God works through covenants, and it's these covenantal promises that he, that he started with down through time that pointed towards the final covenantal promise coming through the Savior, our Messiah. So let's begin by looking at those covenantal promises. The first covenant was with Abraham, otherwise known as the Abrahamic covenant. The, and um, obviously Abraham had two boys, two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael was the firstborn son. He was the first created, but God chose Isaac over Ishmael to be Abraham's heir to get the birthright, and the birthright was the covenantal promise. So here you have the first created son taking a back seat to the second born where God placed him as firstborn. Did I lose you yet? Hang in there. I will. Now Isaac had two bo- Not that Isaac. No. Come on, we were doing pretty good here. Put in the right pick all right. All right, that'll work. Now, Isaac had two boys also, and as you know, they were Esau and Jacob. Esau was the firstborn, the first created, yet Jacob, the secondborn, was actually chosen 
as the firstborn over his older brother to receive the covenantal blessing. And as you know, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He became the father of a great nation. And that nation Israel was also called the firstborn. And it's in Exodus 4.22. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Speaking of the nation, not a person. So we'll wrap it up here, but I have more like this coming out on this same concept of firstborn. And I hope my goal, if you're a Jehovah's Witness tuning in right now, I hope my goal of giving you additional information so you get a better understanding of that word firstborn, I hope I've accomplished that goal. Because firstborn can mean birthright, it can mean birth order. But as you can see in the Old Testament, birthright really takes precedence and predominance over birth order. Birth order is totally meaningless in the Old Testament. There's a reason why firstborn is stressed in the importance of the covenantal promises that ultimately culminates in the Savior, our Messiah, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One last thing to leave you with. Who was born first? Cain or Abel? Yet who carried on the promise? Now the biggest case Jehovah's Witnesses make to say that Jesus Christ is not God and um, he's not equal, eternally equal with the Father is because Jehovah's Witnesses believe and teach that Jesus Christ is a created being. And to support their, their doctrine they go to Colossians 1.15. In the New World Translation, Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now their Bible translations read very similar to this. Um, so Jehovah's Witnesses make the point here. They say, well, you see, Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation. He is a creation. And the Bible says that, you know, God is uncreated, that he is God before all things, and he is um, he has no beginning or end. So they, they point to this and say that Jesus Christ is a creation, created by Jehovah God. And then they, they translate uh, verses 16 through 17 very interestingly as well, and verse 17 also. And it reads in, in the New World Translation, Because by means of him, all other things were created in heaven and upon the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, no matter whether there are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Now I'm reading from the Kingdom into Linear Bible. It's interesting that when I'm looking through Colossians 15 through 17, the word other does not appear in the Greek. In, in fact, it's in brackets in the New World Translation. And they try to, to uh, they translate that way because they believe that since Jesus Christ, as they believe, is the firstborn of all creation or first created, um, he must have... Uh, he must be, ex you know, part of creation. That's why they put the word that um, he is um, before all other things by means of him. All other things were created, so that he is not necessarily the creator, but he creates every other thing that the Father commands him to. That he is a master worker besides the Father in creation. Um, but does Colossians, is Paul trying to tell you here that Jesus Christ is in fact a created being and that he created every other thing? Now, Jehovah's Witnesses would say yes. But let's look at something that I like to call context. Jehovah's Witnesses think they have the right context every time they read the Bible. But let's see if that's so. Remember, the Bible says, test all things to um, test all the spirits. So let's see if this is actually biblical to say that Jesus Christ is firstborn. Is Paul trying to convey that idea? Let's look into the scriptures. Because scriptural testimony says no. What should be noted is not what Paul says. But what Paul does not say in Colossians 1.15, Paul does not say that Jesus Christ is the first created being. He says he uses the Greek word firstborn, but he does not use the Greek word for first created. There's a difference. In fact, here is the difference in the, in the Greek. 
this is first born in Greek, this is first created. There is a difference in the Greek. First born and first created are two different words. They are not the same words. Let's. What does the word first born mean to Paul? What did it mean to Paul? Not what, what, not what does it mean to us today. What did it mean to Paul when he wrote this in the first century? It is very clear and evident through the, uh, the, the scriptural testimony and through historical testimonies as well that the Greek word for firstborn means, it simply means lordship, excellence, and dignity. Now, if we look things into its context in Colossians, we'll see this is exactly what Paul is trying to say. Now we read from the New World, from the Colossians in the NIV. I'll read verses 15 through 17 again. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. We see here that when Paul used the word firstborn, he clearly means excellence, dignity, and lordship. We see Jesus' lordship here when he says that he created all things. Not just, it wasn't created just by him. It was created for him. An attribute that belongs only to God. God creates things for Himself. This we see uh, the Lord Jesus, His sovereignty here in creation. And says He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. Supremacy, ag excellence, and dignity is given to the Lord Jesus here. He is before all things. That makes Him God if He is before all things. You cannot... He cannot be before all things if he is not God. And notice that, you know, God is before all things. He is the preserver of life. He holds all things together. But here we see that that role is given to Christ. It says, in him, all things hold together. It is in Christ that everything is held together. Um, it says here that, so in verse 18, so in everything, he, Jesus, might have the supremacy. Or as the New World Translation puts it, it says, become, because in him that is that he may be first in all things or in other words that Christ may have the supremacy so Paul's not trying to say that Jesus Christ is a created being if he's trying to say that then his argument falls flat on his back it makes no sense he's saying that look he's the firstborn he is above his creation he has the supremacy over his creation because it is by him all things were created it is for him all things to, um, was created and it is in him that all things hold together so that in Christ he may be first in all things and that he may have the supremacy. Jehovah's Witnesses, I challenge you to take things into its context, not to see it through the lens of the Watchtower Society because they are deceiving you. Uh, I know I was in the organization for my whole life and I'm just now sh scratching to get out and to, and I am now starting to see the true light of the, of the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in fact the firstborn of all creation. He is before all things. He holds all things together and he holds all things by the power by his power his sovereignty his will it is in him that all things were created and will continue to be created and, if, and for the glory and in the honor of the lord jesus christ